Today, I will talk about my two favorite topics, money and love. If we take a look at the newspapers, we quickly realize that the big concerns of our time are the increasing income inequality, the environmental pollution, and the financial debt crisis. In addition, unemployment and increasingly excessive consumer society, price bubbles, deflation, as well as inflation, are threatening our societies, not only in Europe, but in many parts of the world. Not few people are therefore once again questioning competition, the wealth increasing effects that are attributed to a free market economy in economic theory. However, these problems do not come about from the free market economy, but from our unnatural design of the money. And this unnatural design of money provokes that our money is not neutral, unlike conventional economic theory would have us believe. The unneutrality of money is probably the main reason for market failure, which unfortunately is recognized only by few economists. Today, I will explain that if we reformed our money in the way Silvio Gazelle once suggested, we have the chance to establish a sustainable and fair economic order. Let us call it market economy that serves people and not vice versa. If we recognized that making money is not an end in itself, we could even move from a market economy that serves people to a true economy of neighborly love in which people achieve happiness serving each other through the use of their talents. The presentation is divided into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to explain the problems that come about from the lacking neutrality of money and how these could be solved. And even though the solution I will present is already 100 years old, the understanding that the big concerns our world faces today can be solved with the solution, in fact, is new. In the second part, I will show how competition, if it works, and especially if it is not perverted by unnatural money, can compel us to behave as we loved one another. Of course, even better than competition forcing us to behave as if we loved one another would be if we really loved our neighbor. So I will sketch a utopian model of an economy based on neighborly love as the driving force behind our action. So let us start with the role of money. Money is supposed to be a medium that facilitates the exchange of real goods and services. We could compare money with the blood of the economy. The blood is supposed to circulate in the body. And if the blood circulation stacks, then the body gets ill, we will die. The same is true with our economy. Money is the blood of our economy. And if the blood circulation of the economy, the money circulation stops, so the economy will get ill. If you look at any textbooks, we find two major functions of money. The first function is that it's supposed to facilitate the exchange of real goods and services. On the other side, we learn that money is supposed to be a medium to hoard, to, to hoard values, to store values. Well, those two functions are pretty contradictory. contradictory. So as the money cannot circulate the economy and facilitate the interchange of goods, the exchange of goods and services, and at the same time be stored under the pillow. From this contradiction in the end, come about all those big problems in the world. The only reason why we do not store money but under the pillow, and the only reason why we still don't have a strong deflation is that we have an incentive to lend our money out. And this incentive is the interest rate. Interest is a reward to abstain from liquidity, in the, uh, as, as Keynes called it. To come back to the metaphor um, of money as the blood of the human body. So if money is the blood of the human body, interest is the drug that maintains money circulating. But as any drug use 
for a prolonged period of time brings along strong negative side effects, also interest does. Unfortunately, this is not well understood in economics. We can understand this or try to understand this, taking a look on how financial assets double. If we have a bank account with a 5% interest rate, annual interest rate, how long will it last until the bank account will have doubled? Well, that will be 15 years. So in 15 years, 100 euros will be 200. 15 years later, 400, 15 years later, 800 and so on. So this is an exponential function. It starts very slow, but then it gets very fast. And this is even true if interests are really low. For even if they are, if interest rates are very low, at some moment, the bank account will have doubled. And always, if something doubles, it's an exponential function, only that if interest, uh, interest rate is lower, the flat part of the curve is larger, but it's still an exponential function. And it's even true if we withdraw the interest from the principal for the interest will, in some part of the economy, end up in another bank account and yield interest. Again, interest. So taking the economy as a whole and taking all bank accounts together, the money supply, which is all bank accounts taken together, develops exponentially. And you can see this in any country of the world. You can look it up for any country, whatever you want. If you take the time period only long enough, money supply will you will see that money supply will follow an exponential function. This is very difficult for us to understand since nothing in nature produces forever exponentially, except cancer. Well, and that, that even cancer is not for always because if the person dies, then also the cancer will not grow anymore. So this is very difficult for us to understand since, since nothing in nature grows forever exponentially. To better understand this idea, we can Ask the question, imagine Jesus had inherited just one cent from his father, Joseph. And if he would have put this in a bank account with a 5% annual interest rates, how much would this bank account be? What was, would be the number in this bank account? Of course, Jesus would not have done this because the Bible prohib prohibits the uh, charging interest. But if he had done it, so the bank account today would be 400 billion planets earth of pure fine gold. So we already understand that this has the system will lead to crisis every certain time. But you can also understand that as any dollar bill states, money is the counterpart of debt. If we bring money to the bank, the bank will have to lend this out. Otherwise, they won't be able to pay the interest on deposits. So any money we deposit in the in the Bank and bank accounts, the bank will try as fast as possible, at least most of it, to lend it out to be able to pay the interest on the de deposits. So we have money and we have debt. And you can see this <laughs> stating on each dollar bill. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. It's not to buy a car or, care or, 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 or meat or milk. No, it's to pay debts, public and private. There's also a very eloquent adage Germany. Die Wertpapiere des einen sind die Schulden des anderen. The financial assets or bonds of the one person is the debt of the other. So money is the counterpart of debt. Any money or most of the money that almost any money that anybody has on its bank account, someone else has to have it as debt. This is all money except for the original um, money originally created by central banks, which is only today a very small fraction of all the money since the money accounts, the money in accounts have has grown by interest. So we can see what I just said, taking a look, for example, on the money supply of the United States, we see clearly how it developed exponentially and also the total debt of the United States developed in the same way. It has to be the same way since there's no interest paying without debt. This is a mathematical logic. There is no, this is a fact actually. There's no interest paying without debt. So if deposits grow, debt has to grow in the likewise manner. In words of Frederick Soddy, Nobel Prize winner Frederick Soddy, money is a credit debt relation from which none can effectually escape. And now we can all start to understand where financial crisis come from. Every 50 to 80 years, we see a financial crisis in all countries. Well, total debt grows exponentially 
the production of an economy cannot grow in the same way. So this has to lead to bankruptcy um, on a larger scale after some time. We can now understand where inflation and speculation comes from. Actually, the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States since 2006 does not publish the money supply M3, which is the most used definition of money supply anymore, because people otherwise might recognize that this grows lots faster than the production, global production of this country. So if money supply grows faster than the production, then we see inflation. And of course, people do not spend all surpluses in consumer goods, which is why inflation would not necessarily grow so fast. They will spend it in real estates or buy stocks. And this is where we see this inflation. It's like a, the speculation bubbles, the price bubbles, a kind of partial inflation in those markets. Interesting because there are so many theories on speculation. It's very simple. There's so much money and the money looks for lucrative investments. We can now understand why we have to grow, where the unsustainability comes from. Total debt growth, so someone has to pay the steadily growing debt burden. So enterprises, if they don't want to lose status quo, they have to sell more. Even, even if they're lucky and not adapted, so they have to still grow because the people they employ want adjustment for inflation, which you've just seen in the end, it comes from the system. And even if it was not for inflation, there's a third reason why we have to grow. This is interest rate is the opportunity costs for all productive investment. Imagine a business owner can, he has to decide where he invests surpluses in his own business or put it, will he put the money in the bank? He will only invest it in his business if his business yields a return at least as high what would the bank would pay, right? So interest is the rhythm or sets the rhythm after which the economy has to dance. It's not, not just a fetish. The problem is that exponential growth of anything physical cannot go forever on a finer planet, which was already discussed by Aristotle. First and second law of thermodynamics tell us that we cannot produce something out of nothing. So all products we have will need energy and input. So and if we keep on growing real GDP, real production every year for centuries in all countries in the world, so we don't have to wonder why we destroy our environment. This is even true for renewable resources, since if we keep on growing and keep on exploiting, then we will exploit even renewable resources some moment on a faster pace than they uh, reproduce. And Herman Daly once said, um, a little bit sarcastically, but true, anything in nature that does not reproduce itself at the rhythm of interest rate is in danger of extinction. Now we can understand where this dichotomy comes from, that we either grow or see unemployment. We know that is this fact, we call it Ockham's law, or we grow or we see unemployment, but we don't really understand why. But now we can understand it. Of course, we have to grow, but if a business would not be able to grow anymore, what will they do? They will try to save up costs in order to maintain the return on investment at least as high as opportunity costs. So, and the Highest cost position, the strongest cost position in any business usually is the human workforce. So there's a strong pressure to either grow or replace persons by machines. And if the machine gets old, then it's also looking for a job. And now we can understand the probably most important um, concern in the world, in Chile at least, but also in other countries, the inequality. Well, inequality comes from because Deposits grow and the debt grow, as we said, they grow in a likewise manner. And if you put money supply and debt on the same coordinating system, well, this year is the wealth gap. And using real data from Germany, we see how financial assets grow and how debt grow. The difference between this point and this point, this is the inequality. And it is an, it is an unjust inequality. It's not just that inequality grows, it grows in an unjust manner because those who receive interest here receive it on the cost of those who get indebted and invest the money productively and work hard to be able to pay interest that the ones here receive without moving a finger. Maybe I have put my first, the, my, my, the money I put in the bank account, I have worked with my own efforts. But if it starts growing, it starts because of the effort of someone else, since money does not work, nor does it have offspring, which also already Aristotle a little bit sarcastically pointed out. 
actually interest in Greek is Tokush, and Tokush also means son or offspring. So money does not have offspring. You can try it, you can take some bills, put them with red light into the, the corner. They will not cohabit. They will not produce offspring. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't really recognize this in economic theory since we use money and capital usually as synonyms. And if we believe that money is a production factor as capital, then we cannot see that there's a difference between producing a real product and, sen and selling it with a gain or receiving interest from lending money. Well, the solution I will present here is from Silvio Gazelle, which is already 100 years old. Um, but nevertheless, it's not really understood until today, and, that, and even less understood that we can solve the big problems in the world with this. Silvio Gazelle immigrated from Germany to Argentine and saw uh, two financial crises in between a short time, and he recognized that this has something to do with money that does not flow. Well, the idea is to make money flow without that the positive interest rate is necessary. Remember, there are these two contradictions of the functions of money. On the one side, it's supposed to circulate. On the other side, it, people want to hoard it. Keynes called this purchase to save the liquidity liquidity preference, preference for liquidity. Well, but why do we have this liquidity pre preference? Everyone wants to hoard. This is natural. Even animals do. Hamsters have it in their cheeks, for example. But the perishability of real goods keeps this natural purchase for saving a check. But our money is easy to store. This is why we want to store and store and store. We want to ever more have money because it's easy to store. So the only reason why we should, the only reason why we should uh, borrow money to someone uh, is interest rate. Interest rate is the reward to part with liquidity, as Keynes said. So Sylvia Gazelle was thinking, how can we make money circulate without that the positive interest rate is necessary? So he thought if money was similar, perishable as real goods are, so then people would not store it as long and we cannot charge interest. We can even be happy if someone lends my money out, so otherwise it would uh, lose value. And to do so, he invented this bill where you have to put like stamp scripts or the stamps in the value of like one or 2% of the value of the bill every two or three months. Um, this is not much, but in well incentive to not hoard the money under the pillow to spend it or invest it or to lend it for free. This way money circulates in the economy, it serves the economy, it serves the interchange of goods without that the interest rate is necessary. Actually, at least not a positive interest rate. This demurrage fee, this incentive not to hoard, actually can be seen as a negative interest rate. So this negative interest rate makes money circulate and does not have the side effects as the positive interest rate does. It was actually successfully proven in Wörgl and many other cities, but the most known one today is Wörgl. You can look it up in YouTube and find the miracle of Wörgl. There was even a, a movie uh, made, which is called Das Wunder von Wörgl, recently made two years ago. The mayor of Wörgl had read the publication of Silvio Gesell and he tried it. Actually, this bill is a bill from Wörgl. It really worked there and pulled the city out of the Great Depression. And it has been also tried by many other cities next to Wörgl, also Liechtenstein, Switzerland, France, Spain, and even in 13 cities in the US, probably because of publication of Irving Fisher, the great Irving Fisher. He also took up this idea and said even that he was considered himself a modest apostle of Silver Gazelle. Unfortunately, today we don't, have all, we don't know lots about this and we have all, almost forgotten it. Alternatives today we could use, of course, electronic banknotes or cash cards um, with some algorithm that um, puts this negative interest rates depending on how long we hoard the money and how long or how, how much money we have on this card. We could also think of a negative interest policy by the central bank, which has even been said by some is that the policy of the current policy of the European Central Bank is already a 
applying Siebe Gazelle, which is, I would doubt, the current policy, negative interest policy of uh, the central bank is not comparable to what Siebe Gazelle wanted because we still can hoard money under the pillow. We are doing it, actually. Uh, it has been exponentially growing hoarding of money, um, cash hoarding in, in, the, in Europe. Um, what is missing is that the bills have to have this negative rate attached to it. Well, and they have some working papers recently coming out from the International Monetary Fund. We're work, talking about this, how to apply the negative interest rate to bills. Well, this is some ideas to, to apply them to the bills at the end, and they refer even expressively to Silver Gazelle. But meanwhile, the bills can be hoard under the pillow. It's just not, the ECB is not applying Silver Gazelle, this idea. This is actually why they also have to print ever more money uh, amount among um, in, in increasing the money base because money does not flow. <laughs> so they're printing ever more of the money that does not flow. Well, and the solution would not be a remedy to all these big problems we have just seen, it would be also a system more resilient against external checks like COVID. Actually, soon we'll see the big financial crisis triggered by COVID which most people then will say, well, this was COVID, when in fact it was only triggered by COVID. Well, and would be a remedy not only to, what not, no, no, it would not only improve the resilience, economic resilience, it would also be remedy to get out of the crisis. And instead of getting countries, everyone debted, taking loans, indebting the country, this way making more money flow, and also the, the, the central banks printing ever more money, augmenting the, money base ever more money that does not flow we could have money that flows instead of countries getting adapted actually as i just mentioned first irving fisher and keynes discussed the idea of gazelle as a solution to get out of the great depression unfortunately this is today not very well known and i was very lucky to see like in, in may the senior vice president of the Fed, federal reserve bank at st louis talking about this talking he he also said we should use silver gazelle money to come out of the crisis he called this hot money credits well in this system as i said i'm pretty sure that we would not be obliged to grow anymore the obligation to grow and the unsustainability has to do with the interest as opportunity cost of any productive investment today we have to grow but most of the growth does not go into development but just on increasing inequality at least if we define development in, as my dear ex-colleague Manfred Magsneev, alternative Nobel Prize winner Manfred Magsneev has defined in his human scale development approach. Here, development is defined as the satisfaction of fundamental human needs. If we define development as the, as the satisfaction of fundamental human needs, very few parts, very little of our development, of our growth goes into development. Most of our economic growth goes just increasing inequality. If we had neutral money, then we were not obliged to grow. But on the other hand, there was no obstacle to grow in case we had to grow because maybe some of the fundamental human needs are not satisfied yet. So we can grow, but we don't have to grow. But 100% of any eventual growth would turn into development. And I'm pretty sure that we could come to what Herman Daly once called the steady state economy, economy with a um, stational equilibrium of input and throughput. And thus, have a sustainable economy. Well, this would be then an economy that serves people, not vice versa. As my dear colleague Sam always, Manfred Maxneev always pointed out that we need, we need economy that serves people and not vice versa. This economy based on this money would be such an economy. We could also call it market economy without capitalism. We also would need um, fight next to changing the money we'd also need to fight the classic market imperfections like um, the dominant position or abuse of dominant market position collusion price collusion or unfair competition money is not neutral unlike textbooks teach us and the non-neutrality of money is probably the main reason for market failure which unfortunately is not recognized by most economists if we reformed our money in the way Silvia Gazelle once suggested, and also consequently fight classic market imperfection, we have the chance to establish a sustainable and fair economic order. And then we could really have the chance
to get close to the ideal of perfect competition. To sum it up, a workable competition, which is the state as close as we can realistically get to the theoretical concept of perfect competition, forces producers to offer the best possible product at the best possible prices to avoid being pushed out of the market. And this should be regarded as favorably as offering good products at good prices is a behavior comparable to charity. In this way, competition causes us to behave as if we loved one another. Well, but even better would be if we also recognize that making money is not an end in itself, then we could even move from a market economy that serves people to a true economy of neighborable love in which we achieve a locative efficiency and happiness by serving each other through the use of our talents. And this, I will develop, this idea I will develop now. 